for non-proliferation uh, of weapons of mass destruction. Our guest is with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He serves as their deputy director for non-proliferation. He was with the Department of Energy, where he worked on issues of non-proliferation primarily. Uh, had interesting experiences. The American on-site inspector of one of the North Korean facilities, which he remarked wasn't exactly a holiday, uh, but but certainly intellectually and professionally an interesting e experience. Uh, he's also uh, uh, did work then on programs uh, connected with the control of uh, Russian materials and expertise, and worked on projects dealing with the control of trade with the aim of uh, eliminating the transfer of uh, uh, nuclear weapon usable uh, uh, materials. Uh, he's continued at Carnegie working in these same areas. He works on the uh, case studies of Russia, of North Korea, Iran, the general questions of U.S. policy in the area. And of course, that's where we especially intersect. I should note in, in passing that he, he also deals with a variety of other questions, China military and, and uh, East Asian politics in general. But tonight, our focus is upon the questions of nonproliferation. Uh, his background both at energy and at Carnegie is absolutely overlaps with, with that. All of us know that this topic has been with us for half a century, nonproliferation. It's existed in many forms. It's been exacerbated, as we all know, by terrorism and the possibility that groups not controllable by self-interest and deterrence, uh, but those who might actually believe in holocausts being good, uh, could get these weapons. And so it's changed the nature of the problem. And we're all interested in what the larger game plan is of the United States with respect to these issues. It's my uh, great pleasure to present John Wolfstall. And there's no way I can live up to that sort of introduction. Um, but it's still very kind, Frank. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to the Baltimore Council and to all of you for coming out on a beautiful evening to spend your um, a few hours inside talking about, unfortunately, not a very pleasant topic. Uh, I sometimes lament. I never get asked to talk about the good things. You know, nobody ever asked me to come and lecture on my love of fine wines. or uh, uh, So I'll have to work on that as well. Um, what I am going to talk to you about is, uh, as Frank described, is um, the U.S. strategy for dealing with uh, weapons of mass destruction, and particularly uh, focusing on the question of nuclear weapons, where I've done most of my work. And um, I could have come here and really bored you with a sales pitch, um, because, uh, as my father warned me, everybody is selling something. Um, and one of the things we are selling at the Carnegie Endowment is a new publication called Universal Compliance. It's a very attractive cover. We were told the cover has to look nice for people to be interested. Um, and it is something that if you um, uh, have questions, if the, you want to get deeper into some of these subject matters, um, or if you need a good resource um, for uh, the state of the world today and where uh, some of the ideas uh, can come from, I'd be very happy to send you a copy. Please come to me afterwards at the reception. Come to our website at uh, proliferationnews.org. We'd be more than happy to share it with you. Um, but I thought instead of giving you the pitch and our uh, concept, which I'll talk a little bit about, um, I thought I would try and talk with you about how I tend to look at the nonproliferation picture. Um, I guess you could say I'm fortunate enough to be paid to think all day about these issues. Some people would think it's rather depressing. Um, but um, in my 15 years of working on this subject, I've now, I think, honed a, a relatively useful way of dealing with the two major threats that the United States and I think the international community faces today, which are the first threat of nuclear terrorism, which Frank described, which is a very different type of threat than the one we had worked on throughout the Cold War and the one that we had envisioned coming out of the, excuse me, the Cold War. And then the second uh, longer term issue, which one that I feel we are less equipped to handle, is the growing demand for nuclear weapon among states and the growing incentive for countries to acquire these weapons either as ways to defend themselves or as ways of a way to intimidate their neighbors or a way to achieve status internationally. And so I'll talk about these two dual threats. Um, and within them, 
a theme will be recurring. And I think within the nonproliferation community, this is now taking hold as, as a question we're being forced to grapple with. And um, I know there are a number of, of, of novels and books on this subject, whether it's Blink or The Tipping Point, which is written by some colleagues at, at uh, uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. But the question in a lot of people's minds is, are we reaching a nuclear tipping point? Um, it won't be the first one we'll have dealt with. Remember, it was President Kennedy who predicted in the early 1960s that by mid-1970, we would have dozens, 20 nuclear countries. Even then, there was a concern that this technology and the demand for these weapons was about to mushroom, if you pardon the nuclear pun. Um, and the question is now, are we facing such a moment? And are we approaching that challenge with the dedication, the resources, and the strategy needed to make sure we get it right? Um, we, we often make mistakes. Having worked in government, this isn't just something I accuse <laughs> others of. Everyone makes mistakes. But are we dedicating the best minds, the best resources, and really our full attention to this challenge? So I'll, I'll deal first with the nuclear terrorism threat, because it's obviously one which um, occupies a lot of people's attention. Um, it, it, it occupies the popular fiction. It occupies the news on an almost regular basis. Just uh, this afternoon, before I came up here, I saw across the wire U.S. intelligence is receiving repeated reports uh, that al Zakawi has acquired either a radiological or nuclear device. Whether that's true or not, we won't know until, God forbid, uh, it's used. But it's clear that this is the pressing threat of our time. We no longer are dealing on a day-to-day -day basis with a nuclear bolt out of the blue from the former Soviet Union. We're not in a time of crisis that will lead to planned catastrophic nuclear apocalypse. What we're dealing with are either apocalyptic groups or groups that are so detached from any system that we value that they're willing to acquire and use these weapons. And we're also dealing with even more traditional criminal or terrorist organizations that simply want this ability to, to produce or, or use a nuclear weapon to leverage, to blackmail, um, both of which we have to deal with. Um, and uh, the unfortunate truth is that, in fact, this threat is very real. Not only is there demand for these weapons, but the supply is out there. Um, the international nuclear complex is large, it is vulnerable, um, and it is one that we, uh, as Senator Nunn has said, uh, we are in a race against time to protect, and it is a race that we are not uh, likely to win at our current rate of speed. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what that means and where we see the particular problems and what some of the solutions are. Um, I, I don't want to just come here and scare you to death. Um, part of the challenge that we uh, deal with in, in uh, organizations that talk publicly is, is to scare you, um, but not to the point of inaction because we do believe that there are things that can and must be done in order to protect our country, in order to protect the norm that nuclear weapons should not be acquired by a larger set of countries, uh, and to ensure that, in fact, the world is safer as a result. The, the whole premise behind nonproliferation is that the fewer countries that have these weapons, the less likely they will be used. And that is a strategy that has borne out over the test of time and one that we would like to see maintained. Uh, there are some who believe that, in fact, a nuclear weapon in the hands of every country means war is gone forever. But I think as we've seen over the course of the Cold War, uh, unfortunately, people do make mistakes and you cannot uh, expect the unexpected. So in terms of the terrorist threat, I think we have to recognize one thing right off. And I think Frank talked about this in, in, in his introduction. We're dealing with groups that we cannot deter in the traditional way we think about deterrence. Uh, they don't have territory that we can hold at risk. They may not have anything that we are able to hold at risk or leverage. Um, and uh, this is something that has really rattled the, the sensibilities of a community which was designed to deal with state proliferation. The reality, of course, is that at least in every model I've looked at, Terrorist groups, criminal organizations, whomever might want these weapons, still have to operate on this planet. They still have to operate within the confines of established nation states. And until a group like Al Qaeda or Am Shinrikyo or another organization that we've not yet discovered can build their own nuclear reactors or build their own uranium enrichment plants, their only recourse is to buy or steal the material they need for a nuclear weapon from an existing arsenal. 
And that then leads to an obvious solution. Secure all of the nuclear material that's out there so that nobody can steal it. Uh, Graham Allison at Harvard has talked about a Fort Knox standard. We've never lost any gold out of Fort Knox, James Bond scenarios notwithstanding. Um, I, I uh, have adopted the, the standard that was put out by the National Academy of Sciences in 1994, the nuclear weapons standard. If there is material out there that can go into a nuclear weapon, let's protect it as if it were a nuclear weapon. The United States has never had a nuclear weapon stolen out of its arsenal. We've lost a few, and that's something we have to recognize, and something well, we joke about it, but at the same time, when we do work in the former Soviet Union, we often today go in with an attitude, let's show you how to do nuclear protection. And in fact, many of the Russians have a very good idea how to do nuclear protection. Some of their ideas can even enhance the way we do our work. Um, the problem is they don't have the resources or they don't have the political mandate to do the job that we would like to see them do. And so that cooperative approach is very important. Um, and we'll talk a lot about Russia, but I think it's important to remember that we're not just dealing with one target set. Um, Russia is, in my view, the largest problem. It is the world's largest nuclear complex, um, upwards of 1,300 metric tons of nuclear material that can be used in weapons. That's a, an impossible number for people to sort of wrap their minds around. It's enough for over 100,000 nuclear weapons, the size of the one used at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So we have a very large job to do. And fortunately, over the past 10 years, the US government, working with our allies, has done a lot. Um, over $6 billion of your taxpayer money has been spent to try and secure those nuclear materials, to help the Russians eliminate launchers that were formerly pointed at the United States. We help to retrain their scientists so that they can be engaged in peaceful pursuits, whether that's peaceful nuclear research, um, the former chemical weapons scientists to go into the pharmaceutical industry. We try and deal with all of the aspects of the, of the Russian nuclear complex. Um, but Russia is not the only problem we face. There are over 45 countries around the world that have nuclear materials that can go into a nuclear weapon. There are only eight nuclear weapon states, North Korea being the ninth that's still a question mark, although it, it, it's less of a question mark every day. But there are over 45 countries that could go nuclear if they wanted to, just from the material in their own country. Um, there are over 40 countries that have the technological basis to build a large nuclear arsenal in a matter of years if they made the political decision to do so. So this is a problem that isn't just focused on one country that we used to uh, face off in the Cold War. It's a, it's a problem that spans the globe, um, whether it's South Africa, whether it's the Congo, whether it's Pakistan, whether it's Iran, whether it's Vietnam, or whether it's here in the United States. We have 11 research reactors on university campuses around the United States that run a material that would be very attractive to make a bomb with. Um, and if you don't believe me, just look back to what we did in 1996 at the Atlanta Olympics. Georgia Tech nuclear reactor on campus was shut down and the fuel was removed just in case. Now, we do have programs to convert these reactors. Many of them can, in fact, be switched over to a fuel that doesn't have application for a nuclear weapon. The problem is, of course, cost. Why would we spend $30 million to convert a US reactor? We're safe. We don't have to worry about terrorist threats here at home. Well, that's going out the window. And so we are looking now at how we deal with not only US reactors, but reactors around the world. Um, and uh, last year, the US Department of Energy launched what's called the Global Threat Reduction Initiative. Um, for human beings, it's much easier to call it the global clean out. Um, there's a lot of nuclear crud that was shipped around the world during the 1950s and 60s and even 70s when nuclear power was the, you know, that was the golden uh, coin, we were, the brass ring that we were reaching for, right? I'm not old enough to remember, although I'm older than I look, but many of the people here will remember nuclear power was gonna be free and limitless. Right? Nuclear cars, nuclear microwaves on your, on your kitchen counter. So everybody wanted a piece of this. And we used nuclear exports as a way of binding countries to us during the Cold War. Well, those reactors are still out there. And um, one of the programs I worked on in the government was to restart a US program to bring that nuclear fuel back to the United States. And it, we had a heck of a time convincing country, people who lived in Wilmington or Charleston or uh, Concord, California, or in Baltimore, that other countries' nuclear fuel should come back through their harbors, right? I mean, it's not in my backyard, buddy. Um, 
And of course, when we began to talk to them about the realities of the problems we were facing, it was a little bit easier. Um, we started with governors threatening to lay down in the tracks. We ended up with some of the governors on our side, not all of them, of course. And, and of course, there's a little grease for the skids. Um, we'll take this and we'll, we'll, we'll build a nice facility for you. Um, so um, Russia is clearly one of the top concerns. And it's not just a question of um, their nuclear weapons, but all of the loose nuclear material that is spread around a number of facilities. Um, but we have other concerns, as I've just mentioned. Pakistan immediately goes to the top of my list. Uh, they have a nuclear arsenal. Uh, our estimates suggest they could build somewhere on the order of 50 or 60 nuclear weapons. Um, and we don't have high confidence in the stability of their country. We know that their nuclear complex is not secure. AQ Khan, the father of their nuclear program, has now been found to have masterminded a nuclear black market which sold nuclear weapons designs and the ability to make nuclear materials to some of our closest friends, Iran, <laughs> North Korea, um, uh, um, Libya. So um, we know that the technology wasn't secured. And why should we take President Musharraf's word that the nuclear material is secure? Before AQ Khan, they said, we promise. We, know how to, we will be responsible stewards for this. Now they promise us their nuclear materials are secure. That seems to me something we can't take anybody's word for and that we need to trust but verify. But again, that, that problem goes much deeper than just those two countries. And we talk a lot about the need to secure these. In terms of, um, in terms of the solution for these ideas, um, this isn't something that is cheap. And it isn't something that we should expect countries with starving populations um, or, or other priorities to take as seriously as we do. I mean, I think most people in this room recognize that we have a particular incentive to help countries safeguard this material. Because odds are, if there's a nuclear bomb floating around looking for a target, nine times out of 10, five times out of 10, you know, the United States looks pretty attractive from, from a terrorist point of view. And so um, I don't think it's unreasonable for the US taxpayer to think about spending money to help people secure this material and get rid of it, bring it back to the United States, ship it back to Russia as a defense policy. It seems to me is as vital as armor for a Humvee. There shouldn't be a distinction. Yet some people still consider this sort of money foreign aid or assistance. And many people like to paint it as foreign aid or assistance. And to be frank, we have problems with the way some of this money is spent. Um, we need to have tight controls on how US taxpayer money is used in countries like Pakistan or in Russia. We want to make sure we're not helping them build a nuclear arsenal or improve their nuclear capabilities. But there are ways to do that. Um, and so we need to take these responsibilities seriously. Um, we also think that um, there are some decisions that, while they rest on the principle of national sovereignty, are too big to be left just to one country's own judgment. Um, this doesn't mean the United States has the moral authority or the legal authority to go in and tell a country how to protect its nuclear materials. But we do have the ability to bring those countries that have these materials together. We have convening power. We have the power of the pulpit. Pulpit's a nice thing. I wish I could carry one of these around with me all the time. Um, but the ability to bring countries together and set a new standard. And the proposal that we have championed is the idea that any country that has material that can go into a nuclear weapon, whether it is Israel or India or the United States or Brazil, whether you're a nuclear weapon state or not, member of a treaty or not, we want to convene a contact group. The president or prime minister should appoint a personal representative. We should set a new standard for how to protect these materials. And we should then provide, not just the United States, the developed countries should provide the funds necessary to make sure this material is secured. It's that important. And if a country says, no, it's up to us, then we have other recourses. We can go to the UN Security Council. We can use leverage. World Bank loans, IMF loans, the traditional tools of diplomacy. In the end, if a country has this material and begins to take actions with it that threaten us, we always have the right to deal with that militarily. We don't spend, you know, as my boss tells me, we don't spend $400 billion on defense for nothing. So that's always going to be in our quiver. But we have a lot of tools at our capability that have proven themselves over time that we, we need to make use of. Um, I'll just touch on this point very briefly, because it's not a point that I am an expert on. But I think it is one that bears a lot of thinking and a lot of research. Um, I, I am old enough to remember that this isn't the first, quote, war on terrorism that the United States has been engaged in during President Reagan's term. Uh, we saw, found ourselves on the cusp of such a war. And it was one that we chose not to 
build and engage in. We didn't define our time by the war on terrorism, even after the attack in Beirut and uh, in uh, West Germany. Um, but it does seem to me that the concept that terrorists can't be deterred needs to be examined. Um, we can protect ourselves, but we can't protect everything. Um, we can't go after every terrorist out there, although we can go after anyone we can find. But the idea that we don't have the ability to hold at risk precious items for groups like this, I think, is one that bears thinking. Um, even, I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. So, question and answers later. Right? Um, it, even if a group is operating independently, they have to get resources from somewhere. Financing has to go through banks. Why don't we work more aggressively, not just on controlling criminal uh, or pursuing criminal cases against banks, but working with lending institutions to set up codes of conduct? Bad for business to be found supporting terrorists. Why aren't we working on those tools? And for those states that do support terrorist organizations, making sure they know that they will be held accountable. Um, the example I would use, although it doesn't, it's not an ex exact corollary, is during the Cuban Missile Crisis, President Kennedy said very clearly, we will interpret any attack launched from Cuba to anywhere in the hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States. We made the same admonition to Saddam Hussein before the uh, war. And I think it's a standard that, while it may not have applied because of the WMD question in Iraq, I think is a very effective one for groups tied to Iran, to, to North Korea, to Syria. And so we need to re-challenge this assumption that once they get the weapon or once they get the material, we're doomed. Because again, I, I think any sort of fatalism isn't healthy, but I would much prefer to protect that material before it goes missing. It's a, an ounce of prevention is, is clearly worth a 500-pound bomb of cure. Um, the second question, as I said, is a much more complex one. And um, I'll, I'll be happy to talk in depth in the question and answers about particular countries, particular case studies, um, to the extent people are, are, are willing and interested. What I will do is give you a sense, um, since I have this um, pleasant position of thinking about this stuff all day long, of where we are on the two most pressing cases in, in North Korea and Iran. Um, and then also um, spend a couple of minutes talking about why I think they're so critical, because there, there are those cases that have the potential to ripple out well beyond their sphere uh, uh, or their region of, of uh, focus. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I hesitate to use this term every time I use it, but I keep coming back to it because I think, I guess it works. Um, you know, are we facing a, a domino theory for nuclear proliferation? It was a theory that was clearly inappropriate for the time in Vietnam. But the idea that as countries proliferate, they spur proliferation in other countries makes sense to me, just from, you know, I guess what Midwesterners would call good old horse sense. If your neighbor starts to arm himself, you start thinking about either moving neighborhoods or building a higher fence or, you know, putting a baseball bat by your door, right? Well, if you're a country, you can't pick up and leave. And if you're talking about nuclear weapons, it's hard to build a fence. And so you don't have as many options. Now, maybe you make friends with a big guy next door, but you may want to have a baseball bat at your disposal, too. And so I think we, we could talk a little bit about that, the implications beyond just those two countries. Um, as Frank mentioned, I, I did have the, the luxury of spending some time in North Korea when I worked for the government. Um, and uh, it, it is an incredible, uh, incredible experience to see a country that, for the most part, exists the same way it did 1,000 years ago. People continue to live at, at the subsistence level off of the land uh, and, and barely live at that. And yet this country, with um, very little in the way of allies, very little in the way of natural resources, um, has mastered the ability to produce plutonium. They're very good at it. Um, I spent a month at the nuclear reactor in the facility where they stored spent fuel rods, which are now presumably uh, been turned into uh, plutonium for nuclear weapons. Um, and so um, there are those who would tell you, well, you know, North Koreans are so backwards, they're in the Stone Age, they couldn't possibly perfect this stuff. That's not a chance I'm willing to make. And the, the, the example I use is uh, we shipped a lot of equipment over to North Korea. When you're when you engaged in operations there, you can't walk down to the Ace Hardware when you run out of bolts. You've got to bring it with you, along with the tuna fish and the wine and the books and the heaters. Well, we brought these fantastic ho heaters, um, you know, the same ones they use on the sidelines for the football games, you know, the sort of jet nozzle exhaust um, propane heaters. Uh, and we went to plug them in and then realized the power is unreliable. It cycles 10, 20 volts off of what you need. 
Um, and so we sat in our work offices all day at about 50 degrees. This was in December, January. So the outside temperature is about 10 degrees during the day, about 20 below at night. Um, and so we're working in, you know, 40, 50 degrees. It's very hard to work the computer with your mittens on. Um, we would go in to meet with the chief engineer, and he's sitting in an 80 degree balmy room, granted filled with, with you know, Russian um, uh, cigarette smoke, um, but because he's got a coil resistance heater that his engineers worked up in the shed. And after a couple weeks, he said, you know, would you like us to make you one? You know, it's a great example to say we, we may have the cutting edge technology, we may have the best stuff, but bronze metals sometimes are good enough. And for the North Koreans, they've perfected a, a bronze metal nuclear arsenal. And so it's something we do have to take seriously. Um, I was somebody who was very uh, supportive of the President's proposal to create the negotiating forum that's known as the Six Party Talks. Um, I think it is a good strategy to bring our allies and to bring China more closely into this process. But at the same time, I've always been nervous, and I think now it's been borne out, that subletting or um, outsourcing our uh, negotiations to other countries is rarely successful. Um, and the principle of not rewarding North Korea's bad behavior, I think, is an important one. But uh, so is the, the principle of keeping nuclear weapons out of the hands of unreliable states. And so I, I fear that um, while the, the idea of keeping these countries involved was a good one, um, we have uh, lost sight of the ultimate purpose, which is to prevent North Korea from becoming an accepted nuclear weapons state. Um, my very, unfortunately, pessimistic prediction is unless we see a radical change in U.S. strategy, we will not only lose that goal of preventing North Korea from basically becoming an accepted state with nuclear weapons. I mean, they just shut down their reactor, which has enough plutonium for another one or two weapons, and I don't see it on the headlines, and I don't see us jumping up and down, and I don't see our allies calling for us to take drastic action. So my concern is not only that we will lose this battle, but that any attempt to try and move quickly to a more coercive strategy will not draw our allies closer to us, but it will drive them away. I do a lot of traveling to South Korea. Um, I don't buy into this idea that South Korea is now an anti-American state. Uh, a lot of what's going on there is very complicated. It's not just, we hate America. But there is a sense that America doesn't have South Korea's interests at heart. And the idea that we would engage in military conflict with North Korea at the risk of losing Seoul is something that they just find to be insane. And it's something that the North Koreans understand, and therefore they've been willing to push through as quickly as they can to establish themselves in a dominant position. Um, it, that's a very rambled way of saying I think we need to alter policy quickly. If we can't alter policy to prevent North Korea from acquiring this capability or maintaining it, we can change the way we're perceived in the region. Because if we don't, we will have no ability to improve our military capabilities and reinforce deterrence in the region. We're going to need to keep more troops in South Korea. American troops are the tripwire. They've been there for 50 years, and we're going to need to maintain a physical presence there. But it's a very difficult thing to do when you're seen as the cause of the division between two peoples as opposed to the protector of an independent democratic state. Um, only because that picture is so dreary. The Iran picture is more pleasant by comparison. Um, but I don't want to send you off uh, smiling, because I think Iran, too, we're in for a very bumpy ride. Um, and it's one where I think um, both the President and the Europeans, uh, particularly the British and, and French, have been very surprising. Because there's a recognition that a repeat of how we ran up to the war in Iraq is not in anyone's interest. And I think here's a case where both the Europeans and the United States have compromised in order to maintain a strong united front against Iran's interest in acquiring a nuclear weapon. Um, it, people will come out on different issues here, or on different sides of the issue. My personal opinion is that I don't think Iranian leaders have said, yes, we want a bomb. I think what they've said is we'd like the ability to make a bomb because we don't know what's going to happen next. And good politicians never make decisions until they absolutely have to. So when the head of the Atomic Energy Agency comes to the, the religious uh, leader, uh, um, Khomeini, and says, we can build a bomb, that's when he'll deal with it. But at the same time, there's no doubt in my mind that technology is for a military purpose. Um, and uh, only a united front with the Europeans and the United States is going to convince Iran that it is not in their interest to go this route. Um, Iran is not North Korea. They have a tremendous number of reasons to want to be integrated into the international community. 
Oil is an obvious one, but status is another. Um, they want to be seen as a, as a respected player in the international field. Um, the worst thing you can do uh, to an Iranian is compare them to how we treated Saddam Hussein in Iraq. They don't like to be fingerprinted. They don't want to be required to have extensive visa requirements. Um, they're a very proud nationalistic country. And so the idea that you can trade an alternative form of status for a nuclear weapons program is one that has at least some potential to succeed. I'm not here to sell you, you know, a bill of goods and say, oh, yeah, all we got to do is promise to treat them nice and they'll give up the bomb. But I do think that if we are smart about it, we have an opportunity to convince Iran that they don't need to have the ability to produce specialized uranium that can go into a nuclear weapon. Um, I am not one who buys into this concept, well, they're an oil-rich country, so they don't need nuclear reactors. We're an oil-rich country, and we have a lot of nuclear reactors. You know, it, it's not as simple as you might read or, or hear about. Um, and remember that back in the time of the Shah, we were the ones that were endorsing a nuclear program in Iran. We were ready to sell upwards of 20 nuclear reactors. And, and when we've been going around the world the past 10 years saying, don't sell, don't sell, don't sell, the Russians come to us and say, well, you're clearly just trying to preserve your market. Now, they've learned that we're not all about markets, but, you know, we have to be realistic about the way our words are perceived uh, when we talk with other people. Um, so the question in Iran, in my mind, is really very much one of, of you know, the old standard uh, uh, cliché of carrots and sticks. How much is it worth to us to keep Iran from becoming a nuclear weapon state? I would argue, it, I wouldn't phrase it this way if I were at a political gathering, but I would argue it's worth a lot. And we should be willing to engage in a process by which Iran can benefit if it doesn't go down this route. What do I mean by that? There's nothing that says Iran can't have a nuclear reactor. To, to produce nuclear electricity. Um, the Europeans could easily provide that. That wouldn't give them the inherent ability to produce nuclear weapons. They would need specialized facilities to extract the plutonium from that fuel or to enrich uranium for it. But if we can verify that they don't have those facilities, why couldn't they have nuclear reactors? Why couldn't we guarantee that they have a right to those reactors? Um, as well as other forms of, of uh, incentives, security guarantees. Um, one of the reasons Iran has been interested in a nuclear weapon is not because of the axis of evil speech this program started many years ago. They were worried about Iraq. They were worried about Saudi Arabia for a long time. That relationship has improved somewhat. Um, but they have security interests. And if you were sitting in Tehran, a nuclear weapon might look very attractive. Doesn't mean we have to accept their perception, but we have to at least understand it and begin to work on ways that we can give them an alternative way to feel secure. We've done a lot for them. I mean, getting rid of Saddam Hussein was a big favor to Iran. Um, and I'd like to think that if we had played our cards a little bit more carefully, we could have gotten more benefit out of that. I understand why we can't. We have a unique history with Iran. We can't just knock on the door and say, hi, we're back. You know, did you miss us? Um, but uh, two of my, two of my um, bosses, I have a lot of bosses at Carnegie, two of my bosses just got back from Tehran. Um, the United States is incredibly popular among the majority of the population, particularly among the youth. Um, the, the conservatives know this. And when you talk with conservative elements, my understanding is they say, look, we know that whoever opens up relationships with the United States is going to be incredibly popular politically. Why would we let the reformers take credit for that? So they're also looking for a way that they can break through. Now, maybe they feel a nuclear weapon is the way to break through. I, I'd like to see it happen another way. But I think we have to try and understand and game them a little better. Um, and I'll be glad to talk about specific details in the Q&A about that if people want. But what I want to leave you with is this problem that if North Korea goes nuclear and Iran goes nuclear, I don't think our top concern is that tomorrow a missile comes flying in from Tehran or from Pyongyang and lands, uh, I'll say New York since we're in Baltimore. Um, you know, that doesn't make sense. Deterrence still works. The last thing a country wants is a big smoking trail from their country to you know, a nuclear blast site in the United States. That's an easy one to, to respond to. Um, the concern is that, one, they won't protect those materials. They'll go missing. We have some concerns about the way they handle the rest of their country. Why wouldn't we have concerns about that? And more importantly, I think we have concerns about how their proliferation would spur and affect the dynamics in the region. Um, these are, in many ways, the canaries in the coal mine. Um, and if they die, it, it, it suggests that the regime that has kept them alive, that has kept them non-nuclear, isn't healthy. There's a reason that countries want nuclear weapons. They don't just do it because they're nuts. They do it because they think they will benefit from it. 
And if one country or two countries think that they can benefit from it, then others are clearly going to think, well, we can benefit too. And I'm not trying to make some sort of grand you know, statement about the U.S. nuclear arsenal. I am not a person that supports zero nuclear weapons in the United States. But I think we have to recognize that when we talk about our nuclear arsenal as being important and essential to ourselves, it sends a signal that if the world's conventional superpower needs them, why don't we? I mean, it just stands to reason. If you're a strong country and you need nukes, if you're a weak country, you probably need them more. And it's not this, the U.S. Russia, whose conventional military is a shambles, increasingly relies on their nuclear weapons as a, as a, as a deterrent rhetorically and militarily. And that sends a signal in their sphere of influence as well. There's a reason that France and Britain hold on to their nuclear arsenals, right? I mean, they're major economic players, but they still hold that nuclear card, and they're not directly threatened by many countries. You know, it's status for them. And the longer we maintain these arsenals, the harder it is to tell other countries, look, yeah, I know we promised to disarm in 1970, but you, know, you, you can stay nuclear for a little while longer. Um, but the concern is, of course, that if you then have these smaller countries that acquire this capability, it's extremely difficult to keep your allies or your enemies from following that same path. And the countries I worry about the most uh, in, in the, the East Asian region is South Korea. South Korea looks around and they say, OK, let's look, take a look at our neighborhood. Russia has nuclear weapons. China has nuclear weapons. North Korea has nuclear weapons. Japan doesn't have nuclear weapons, but they're sitting on a lot of plutonium for their peaceful nuclear program. We're the only good guys, from their point of view. And yet, we're the only one that doesn't have the ability to build a nuclear weapon. What's wrong with this picture, they ask themselves. And so they think, and very openly, they talk about, of course, in 10 years, we'll need to have our own ability to produce nuclear fuel, just economically speaking. They get 40% of their uh, electricity from nuclear power in South Korea. So you know, we restrain them for a long time, but it's very difficult to do that over the long term. Um, in the Middle East, pick your, pick your countries, whether it's Egypt, whether it's Saudi Arabia, whether it's Syria. The really interesting one is whether it's Turkey. All of these countries are directly affected by Iran's interest in a nuclear weapon, and also affected by the ability of the United States to protect those countries if Iran has a nuclear weapon. And so I think that whole dynamic uh, is one that we have to really um, stay focused on. And so what I would leave you with is uh, the central concept, again, that you know, are we at this tipping point? And a recognition that if you look around the world at who would suffer the most if the world became increasingly nuclear, and who benefits the most if the world remains non-nuclear, or at least largely non-nuclear, it's the United States. We are the world's conventional superpower. The last thing we want is the ability for other countries to asymmetrically equal our conventional power. There's a reason we didn't start regime change in North Korea. So the idea that we have a stake in this system is one that I think has to be at the central core of how we look at the nonproliferation problem. We don't do this for charity, and we don't do it out of goodwill. We do it for self-interest. And that's why I argue that we need to be willing to at least engage in the diplomatic and the multilateral approaches that have convinced countries internationally that they too have a stake in the system, that their security is better off. If we don't, and we go to this every man for himself world in the question of nuclear power, in the question of nuclear materials, in the question of nuclear weapons, I think we have the most to lose. Um, and so uh, I, I think, I, at least from the nods, I think I have a fairly friendly audience in understanding that. But it's one that I think needs to be uh, routinely and, and consistently repeated and explained as we deal with our friends, our neighbors, our elected officials, um, and with the world at large. So with that, I'll be more than happy to take your questions. Two questions. One, please connect the sunshine policy with the possibility of uh, improving the North Korea's uh, nuclear posture. And then secondly, would you explore um, the implications of the reality of Israel having nuclear weapons? Sure. Be happy to. Um, it, it's really interesting when you, I think you, you put your, your finger on it. Um, unification is not the uh, catchphrase um, it, it, among any of the countries. Um, even South Korea, it's such a politically explosive topic um, that the South Korean government almost collapsed because it was discovered they had a small project looking at how they would actually deal with unification. 
because it suggested somehow that they were actively pushing for the collapse or potentially even military strikes against North Korea. That's how much the dynamic has changed from where we were, say, 10 years ago. Um, in fact, the only country that I would argue has talked openly about having a desire for North Korea to collapse is the United States. China doesn't want it. South Korea doesn't want it. I have, I have Japanese colleagues telling me they feel more threatened by a unified Korea than they do by a nuclear North Korea, which I find amazing, but I think we have to deal with the, the, the dynamics that we have. Um, and Russia, I think, you know, has, has no real, real incentives either way, um, but nobody has an incentive in instability. So I, I don't think we're about to get back to a reunification policy or that sort of feel-good time anytime soon. Um, I do think we are not well prepared for the possibility of regime collapse. It's something that could happen. I, I don't want to build my policy around it because I don't think you can, you can count on things like that happening. Um, but um, uh, so my sense is that it's not a, a high priority and it's not one that's rapidly approaching as a priority for us. Um, on, on the Israel question, I think you're exactly right. And I'm, I fall into this, I blame myself because I don't spend a lot of time talking about Israel. And it is a problem in terms of our approach on nonproliferation and in terms of um, uh, trying to deal with nuclear materials around the world. But I think there's a slightly different twist on the way Iran talks about Israel and the way they actually think about it. Um, I don't think Iran feels directly threatened by Israel's nuclear capability. Um, of all the nuclear weapon states, Israel has adopted a fairly benign nuclear policy. Um, it's one that I think um, has been of the least threatening, although I'm not talking about other actions in Israel that I don't particularly care for. Um, but it is a very effective rhetorical tool in not just Arab countries, but other countries to say, well, the United States says this is important, but they don't take care of Israel. And um, it's a rhetorically important tool in Iran because of how Israel's behavior vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians in the Arab world is seen as an open sore. And even in spite of that, Israel is allowed to maintain this status. Um, that doesn't mean, in my view, that I think we should come out tomorrow and say Israel has to disarm, because I don't think that's realistic, and I don't think that's really what's driving Iran's program. But I do think we have to be focused and serious and consistent when we say all countries in the Middle East should get rid of all weapons of mass destruction. And we should start thinking seriously about how we're going to deal with Israel's capability. Right now, what we say is arms control and nuclear issues will have to wait until the peace process reaches a point of maturity. Um, and I think we need to at least reconsider whether or not that posture might not be slowing down any ability to bring Iran into the peace process and other countries from taking it seriously. You alluded earlier to the problem of Pakistan. Uh, would you comment uh, further on the, uh, the problems Pakistan represents should, uh, from the American perspective, the wrong regime come to power? Um, it, when, when one of my other bosses gives talks like these, um, he really draws, I think, a very important distinction and one that I'm glad I have a chance to, to make with you as well. Um, and I'll, I'll be honest, I voted Democratic. Um, it doesn't mean I, I look at what the Bush administration has done. One or I, two people here did as well, <laughs> I think. Um, it it, it no, doesn't I mean I, I look at everything the Bush administration does and I see fault. I think, in fact, the Bush administration has adopted some very important steps, particularly with regards to Russia. Um, and I think they don't get as much credit as they probably do deserve on how they have reduced our nuclear arsenal and how they have begun to think about how our military is going to be employed. I mean, I think you know there, there's middle ground here, and it's one that I wish um, was more more, uh, more recognized in Washington. Um, but there is a major philosophical and strategic shift that the Bush administration has made on this issue of nonproliferation. And you can see it in the language that presidents have used throughout the nuclear age. Beginning in 1945, we adopted a very simple policy. Proliferation is bad. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you are. But if you acquire nuclear weapons, it's a problem. It's the weapons, stupid. The proliferation of weapons of mass destruction represents a clear and present danger to the security of the United States. This is in the US language ad infinitum, um, Republicans and Democrats. The Bush administration has a different view. For them, it is the weapons in the hands of bad people that is a problem. 
And that's why they can look at a country like Pakistan and say, you are now a major non-NATO ally and can buy F-16s and advanced military capabilities because you're our friend. They can look at East Asia, and when I talk to my colleagues and I say, look, if North Korea goes, South Korea is going to go, Japan's going to go, and they say, well, look, they're not our enemy. Why are we threatened if Japan and South Korea go nuclear? And I turn back to the Shah. Because your friends aren't always your friends. They switch from your, Pakistan was our friend, then they were our enemy, then they were our friend. My sense is they're going to be our enemy again one day. And I'd much rather deal with that situation in the absence of nuclear weapons. And so I do think there is this, this fundamental shift that's taken place that does explain why the Bush administration views this issue the way they do. Uh, and it's one that I think is going to have some very long-standing consequences for U.S. policy. Where have all the realists gone? <laughs> can, you put, can you put that to music? Please? Um, let's see. Um, I like to consider myself more realistic than I was in my youth. Um, but I'm probably still naive enough to believe that um, there is a possibility that countries benefit from the peaceful, stable interaction among states. That's the premise the United States was founded on when we were not a strong country. Um, and uh, the argument that now, because we are strong, we have to use our power to make sure that we don't have to misuse our power, I think is one of those questions that I can't answer. However, um, power has a lot of different manifestations. And one of the central concerns I had about the entire presidential debate, and as a frustrated Democrat, I, I blame myself in this process as well. The Bush administration put out a document in 2000, the National Security Strategy document, actually 2001. And it essentially said the purpose of American power, military might, is to preserve American power. It was a tautology that um, our power is to be maintained to not only defeat adversaries, but to convince countries not even to compete with the United States. Now, I don't argue that that can be a very effective strategy and that we don't have the ability to maintain that. What I wanted to see in the campaign and what I still think the American people want and deserve is a question about what is American power really for? We have principles. The president talks about these principles for democracy and freedom and I think is personally firmly committed to them. And I think he understands now in a way he probably didn't four years ago about how you achieve those. But the idea that we are simply strong to be strong strikes me as very short-sighted. And so I have no quarrels with what you've said, but I want to see a strategy and a greater purpose applied to that. I, I, just one second. So, I, and I, I still am naive enough to think that you know the American public, whom I don't often see when I fly from one coast to the other, you know, in, in, in the heartland, really believe in these principles that we talk about and 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 are committed to. The question is, uh, do we have too much of a, uh, a carrot approach and an insufficient stick approach, and thereby paradoxically sometimes encouraging people to get nuclear weapons so they can get more carrots? Mm -hmm. um, is that Close enough? OK. If this was on the bestseller list, I would accuse you of having read my work and then repeating, uh, you know, throwing me a softball. Because um, a, a central core of what you've just put forward is a part of what we have come to over the past 18 months as we've done this study and traveled around the world. We talk about the need to devalue the political and military utility of nuclear weapons as being a central component of a strategy designed to reduce the demand for these weapons. And we have, largely I think because of both human nature and the political system, tended to only focus our attention and therefore only talk about bargains when a country becomes a problem. North Korea, Iran, then we start to talk about, okay, well what can we give you, how do we offer you? And today we're not focusing on the South Africa's that gave up six nuclear weapons before 1991. We don't spend a lot of time and money and effort and prestige on Kazakhstan and Ukraine that gave up nuclear weapons back in the mid-1990s. So the idea that we need to get ahead of the curve 
and be clear in rewarding countries that have made the right decisions, and to incentivize countries that never went that way, Japan, South Korea, and others, so that they have a stake in the system, I think is a very important principle to, to keep in mind. That is a, a, a fundamental principle within the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which was signed in 1970, was indefinitely extended in 1995, and which the 188 members are going to get together in New York next month to review, as they do every five years. The idea is you live by the rules, you stay away, you know, stay away from cigarettes, you know, stay away from nuclear weapons, and you can benefit from all the benefits of peaceful nuclear technology, nuclear reactors and uh, agricultural and medical. Um, the problem is we haven't always stuck by that bargain, and in some cases that's never been enough. And so I, I think your point is right on, that we need to be serious about getting ahead of the curve. But at the same time, this argument has been made a number of times with regards to the deal we struck with North Korea in 1994, that we decided to trade North Korea's nuclear arsenal or their nuclear infrastructure for a modern set of nuclear reactors that would be a much greater benefit for electricity production. And the argument was made, well, you're rewarding proliferation. You're going to create an incentive for countries to start a nuclear program. And I'm a little skeptical that countries start nuclear programs just so they can get a couple of nuclear reactors from the United States. I mean, I do think countries think about nuclear weapons as a way to get our attention, both in a good way and a bad way. And we need to, as you, I think, in your question suggested, find ways that we can get their attention before they have to resort to that sort of negativity. Would you comment upon uh, the situation in Brazil? Sure. Uh, very briefly, because there are a lot of questions, and I, I want to get to as many as I can. Um, in the 1980s, there was a nuclear rivalry between Argentina and Brazil. Um, you can debate whether it was a full-fledged nuclear weapons program or just a military idea. Um, but it was one that was resolved bilaterally with some assistance from the United States, and where we aren't currently concerned about a nuclear weapons intention in either Brazil or Argentina. The problem with Brazil, uh, and I actually, we're, uh, we're putting out a new book, and so I was just editing this chapter today. The problem for Brazil was timing. Um, the, 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 the dispute they had with the International Inspection Authority, the IAEA, over what sort of access would be given to this new enrichment plant came out almost the same week that we discovered Iran had a secret large enrichment facility. And so all of a sudden, these things were popping up all over. Um, and so Brazil got caught in a very unfortunate um, um, situation where they were perceived as hiding or hedging on their nuclear commitments at a time when Iran was clearly in our, in our, in our um, uh, spotlight. And so my personal view is I don't have personal concerns about Brazil's nuclear program as leading to a nuclear weapons capability. But there's a larger problem here, which is um, Brazil is interested in developing a domestic uranium enrichment capability which means they could produce material that could go in nuclear weapons if they wanted to. And this is at a time when we're looking around the world and saying, this probably isn't the best technology for every country to have on their own. And if we make an exception for ourselves, because the United States has this, and then we make an exception for Japan, because they have it, and then we make another exception for Brazil, how do we then turn to Iran and say, oh, but you can't have it? Um, and this is one of the more complex issues, which I didn't get into tonight, and I'm happy to send you a copy of the report, and you can read it until you fall asleep. Um, but, it, but it is this question of um, those sensitive nuclear facilities, enrichment and reprocessing, um, which can be very important and in some ways essential to nuclear power, um, are there limits that should be placed on who can have them? Um, and what sort of international structures might be built that can make those restrictions tolerable? Can we guarantee to a country, you promise not to build these things ever, we'll guarantee you can get a peaceful supply of fuel and we'll take it back. Is that enough? We've looked at these questions in 1945. We looked at them in the 1960s. Uh, we looked at them in the 1980s. You know, it's my generation's time to deal with these unsolvable problems. But the, the, the question is, what are we doing to prevent uh, um, the inevitable dirty bomb in the United States? Um, uh, well, I clearly didn't do it well enough, and so I'll, 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 I'll add some more to it, because you put me in front of a mic and let me go. Um, I don't think we're doing enough, I think, is the bottom line. Um, for, for those that 
don't get to think about this every day. There's a distinction between a nuclear weapon, the type that was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and that we have, have many of, and the idea of a radiological weapon. This is uh, a device that would use a conventional explosive to spread radioactive material. It doesn't produce a nuclear yield, but it spreads radioactive contamination, and depending on the material, it can be incredibly deadly. Um, the problem is there's far more radioactive material in the world than we can ever protect. We can't seal it off. We can't hunt it down and secure it. For the most deadly of it, we can try and secure what we know about in a better way. And the U.S. government, as part of this global cleanout, is also working with other countries on uh, trying to protect radiological sources um, and other uh, dangerous materials. Um, and the U.S. government has uh, engaged in a number of initiatives, which I think was probably close to Baltimore's heart, in terms of port security and in terms of what's called the Container Security Initiative, where we don't just try and protect ships that once they're in Baltimore Harbor, but we go to Singapore, we go to Rotterdam, we go to those major ports around the world, we track containers in a more focused way, and we try and install radiological detectors so as they're leaving the port, we know we have a problem. Again, we only get to inspect 10, 20 percent at the best of the number of uh, containers that come into the U.S. any given day. Um, so there are things we can do uh, to, pr to protect ourselves at the border. The other thing I think that we haven't done well enough, and this is um, I, I, a reason I'm glad you asked the question, is, is I think public education. You, you say you grew up with the bomb. Um, as I was entering my teen years, I was very active in a um, um, uh, public interest research group looking at um, some of these issues among population in, in New York were fallout shelters properly equipped and, and staffed and, and people trained. Um, there was an education effort. People did learn to live with this threat, even if you know, tuck, duck, and roll really wasn't an effective strategy. Um, we don't have that today. Um, what we have is, unfortunately, um, the Attorney General going on TV and saying, we caught a dirty bomber, Jose Padilla, in, in Chicago. You know, we got him. And people go crazy. They think a dirty bomber was in the United States, and they don't know what a dirty bomb is. Um, for all intents and purposes, if you don't hear the explosion on a radiological bomb, you're never going to be affected by it. Um, general rule of thumb, unless it is the most deadly of material in the right form or shape, um, more people will die from heart attacks or car crashes fleeing the scene than will ever die from cancer from the material. Now, that's not an absolute, but there is an education campaign that I think it needs to happen in the United States because we're still, for the most part, dealing with the post Three Mile Island Chernobyl scenario that nuclear is bad and therefore anything nuclear is a disaster. And I think we have to be more, um, more educated than that. I have to apologize to everybody with still a question. It's, it's past 10 after. But I'd like to thank our guests for what is obviously an extraordinarily interesting evening. Thanks so much. Thank you very much.